So let me begin um, with a very brief introduction um, as more people enter the room. Uh, hello and welcome. My name is Christine Haight Farley, and I'm a professor here at American University Washington College of Law. And along with uh, my colleague Michael Carroll, um, I'm one of the faculty co directors of the program on information justice and intellectual property law. Uh, this event is co sponsored um, by a new program at our law school um, on tech law and, and security. Um, so we're very, uh, we're very excited about this new program and we're very uh, uh, pleased to be able to partner with them on this event. Um, we are, um, you know, in the beginning of the uh, semester and we're also in the beginning of a new administration. Um, and uh, I think most of the people in this room um, uh, tend to have uh, as, as a lens for, for all that we're taking in or as a background um, set of concerns, um, tech and innovation law policy. And so as we're thinking about the new administration and the, and the possibilities that it presents, um, I think we all have lots of questions about some of the issues that have been bubbling up in the space. Uh, and so we're delighted um, to be able to welcome Andrew Burns to this event. Um, uh, Welcome, welcoming you virtually to our law school, Andrew, even though I'm not in it and you're not in it, and nobody's in it, but um, to our law school virtual event at least. And we're very pleased that you're here. Um, so the um, announcement about this event has a fuller um, uh, biography of Andrew and, uh, and I'm sure you can find even more information about him um, on LinkedIn, et cetera. Um, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of things about Andrew um, which I think fully explained why um, we've tapped him to come here to talk to us about these issues. Um, oh, and uh, yeah, okay. Um, so Andrew has spent over 20 years at the intersection of tech and in in innovation, law, business, and public policy. Um, and, it's, and it's really quite uh, an unusual career to be able to span all of those areas and have and have such a passion and interest um, across all of those areas. Um, uh, he's worked in law firms, he's worked in the federal government, and he's worked in several tech startup companies. I met Andrew when he was uh, IP litigator partner in um, Covington and Burling. And during uh, President Obama's second term, Andrew was the chief of staff at the USPTO. He's currently the Deputy General Counsel and Global Head of Public Policy at GetAround, which is a connected car sharing marketplace. Um, and so on behalf of the law school, I am delighted to welcome Andrew to this event. And I'm delighted um, that so many of you have made time to spend um, yet another hour on Zoom with us. Um, we have a wonderful, audience um, of students, faculty from other law schools, um, practitioners, uh, public servants, um, really a, a, a great crowd here, Andrew. So um, before I turn it over to Andrew, I would just like to invite all of the participants um, to feel free to um, make questions using the Q&A function. Um, and as Andrew speaks, I'll be monitoring that and we will reserve the last 15 minutes um, to have a Q&A with Andrew. So um, uh, please use that function and I'll remind you again at the end of Andrew's presentation. Um, but with that, um, thank you, Andrew, and, and take it away. Well, thank you very much. Let's uh, get those slides up here. Um, there we go, excellent. So uh, thank you very much, Christine. It's uh, just fantastic to, to be here with you and a group of folks who, yes, probably do have uh, do have a bit of Zoom fatigue, uh, but hang on for the next hour. I think it'll be worth it. Um, and certainly I want to thank um, the Washington College of Law's programs on information justice and IP, as well as the new one on Tech Law and Society, which is a really exciting initiative uh, today. Before I begin, I want to just clarify that the reviews I'm expressing today are my own and uh, shouldn't be attributed and certainly are not expressly endorsed by uh, uh, GetAround or any organization with which I'm affiliated. So 
Exactly one week ago, President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris took their oaths of office. Their successful campaign promised to build back better, a future-focused counterpoint to President Trump's backward-looking Make America Great Again. Build Back Better meant tackling the economy's structural weaknesses and inequalities that make life so difficult for many working families, particularly during the pandemic. As the Biden-Harris administration begins, our country confronts a myriad of significant challenges, not only the economic ones that motivated Build Back Better, but also challenges that go to the heart of who we are as individuals, how we relate to each other, and whether our society and our democracy will thrive or decline. Now today I'm going to talk about four of those challenges and how sound technology and innovation policy can help us overcome them and build the country back better. The first challenge is foundational, a deficiency of sustainable critical infrastructure decades in the making. Now for the last few years, Infrastructure Week has been the butt of jokes about President Trump's announced but never quite fulfilled focus on a rare topic that folks thought would bring both sides together. But joking aside, we can't wait any longer to improve our infrastructure. The second challenge was top of mind during the campaign and with COVID uh, expanding even more aggressively is even more salient today. And that's stagnant and for many declining economic opportunity and mobility, especially in underserved communities and again, exacerbated by the pandemic. The third challenge is many Americans' loss of trust and declining sense of control over their own lives. While certainly not a new development, as information technology and the internet, along with the collection and use of personal data become increasingly dominant in American life, their loss of control, trust and agency has accelerated. And particularly in light of recent attacks on our democratic system, and the resurgence of unrepentant white supremacist terrorism. The fourth challenge is social injustice and division. Now, injustice and discord has regrettably been a consistent theme of our American story. But while it's always been present, the speed and scope of spread of misinformation and hate online has aggravated those divisions and incited conflict offline as well as on. President Biden pointedly referred to this fourth challenge in his inaugural address saying there is truth and there are lies, lies told for power and profit. And each of us has a duty and a responsibility as citizens, as, as Americans to defend the truth and defeat the lies. Technological development has impacted American life since its founding, enabling and phasing out types of work, methods of communication and ways of life. Technological advancements and the innovations enabled by them have created a better quality of life in many ways. And I'm proud of the work I've done with technologists and innovators during my career as an attorney, operations executive, and government official. But despite the good that technology has done, some of the transformations that technology has brought to our economy and society have had decidedly mixed effects. Some have helped bring about or amplify the four challenges I'm talking about today. How policymakers react to these transformations, though, will determine whether technology and innovation will help us overcome the challenges or block the way. So let's focus first on the first challenge. We can build back better only if our critical infrastructure is robust, responsive to the needs of all Americans and sustainable for the long term. Now, much of the conversation about infrastructure is about improving aging and inefficient infrastructure. And in that regard, I'll talk about transportation in a bit. But thinking about the potential of technology for ensuring that we have sustainable critical infrastructure, there's no more important issue than high speed Internet or broadband. Now, the pandemic has put in sharp relief the importance of broadband. We're living it here today. It's essential for working and learning remotely, using telehealth services, accessing news and entertainment, binging on Netflix, right? Uh, connecting virtually with friends and family and, of course, watching tech policy speeches like this one. Personally, my favorite use of broadband is for virtual karaoke, but that's just me. But karaoke aside, without broadband, it's increasingly difficult to discover and access economic and educational opportunities. More than 21 million Americans, and maybe even quite a bit more, don't have access to or can't afford broadband service. So even after 25 years of trying, pretty much my entire professional life, we have still not closed the digital divide. And the further out we push the leading edge of technology, the divide between the digital haves and the have nots widens. We need to commit to closing the digital divide once and for all 
by ensuring that broadband is accessible and affordable for all Americans, including in rural and other underserved communities. We need to increase investment in broadband infrastructure at the federal, state, and municipal level, with particular attention to providing high-speed internet service where none exists today. At a time where state and municipal governments face historic financial pressures due to the pandemic, though, federal investment is critical. And where feasible, public-private partnerships will enable public dollars to go further and leverage the operational expertise of the private sector. Of course, the digital divide isn't just about having broadband available in a community, because accessibility and affordability of broadband is as critical as the underlying fiber optic cables. In fact, an April 2020 survey by the Pew Research Center found that a majority of low-income families and even a quarter of middle-income families worried about paying their broadband bills. And it's no wonder, because according to a new America Open Technology Institute report from last year, American consumers pay more for broadband than consumers elsewhere in the developed world, with rural and tribal communities paying the most for the slowest speeds. Targeted subsidies combined with education about digital literacy and skills are the best way to close that accessibility and affordability divide. The COVID relief package that passed in late December is, is an important step for sure, making a significant investment in secure broadband infrastructure and providing substantial new financial assistance for low-income families to pay for service. But there's still a lot more that we need to do. Many children now depend on online education and enrichment opportunities, and so are among the most affected by internet service that isn't fast or consistent enough for their higher bandwidth uses. A recent study by the Alliance for Excellent Education showed that nearly one third of all students expected to learn online had inadequate home internet access. So we need to update and upgrade the Federal Communication Commission's E-rate program that provides affordable broadband for schools and libraries, including to support access at home of educators and students, not just on school grounds. And we need to support efforts by school districts and others to ensure that students have devices that are suitable for online learning and available to the student when it's time to learn. In addition, we need to ensure that there are sustainable funding sources for broadband infrastructure and accessibility. One way is better aligning the contribution mechanisms for the Universal Service Fund with the way that Americans are actually using telecommunication services today so that funding for broadband isn't dependent on fees assessed on telephone or other non-broadband services. And finally, while wired service is certainly a priority, we need to accelerate the rollout of 5G, the fifth generation of wireless technology, through funding of research and auctioning additional spectrum. High speed, low latency, high reliability internet access through 5G is a game changer, not just for those of us using mobile devices, but for new networks of connected devices, enabling rich applications like augmented reality, personalized healthcare, and just-in-time manufacturing. Digging deeper on this first challenge and how we can solve it. You know, although we can, and these days must, do so much from home, our transportation and mobility infrastructure has never been more essential to our economy and society. Unfortunately, today, that infrastructure is in many respects in poor condition, unsafe, inefficient, inequitable, and bad for the environment. In fact, transportation is the largest contributor of the country's greenhouse gas emissions, in turn contributing significantly to climate change. There's a lot that needs to be done to build it back better, to create a system that's more efficient, flexible, safe, accessible, and ecologically sound. Technological innovation is already transforming transportation and policy can accelerate these desperately needed changes. For example, in passenger transportation, we need to move away from dependence on single user gasoline powered passenger vehicles to a smart mobility ecosystem, which includes the full range of transportation modalities, utilizes data regarding individuals mobility usage to improve the system, increases use of clean technology, and leverages a community-based approach for ensuring that mobility options serve everyone. A smart mobility system is multimodal, with many options other than simply using your car for every trip and then parking it when you're not using it. For some trips, a public bus, train, or light rail may best fit your needs. For others, it might just be easiest to pull out your phone, open up an app, and have a ride in 10 minutes. Or maybe you need a car, but you don't own one or you don't own the right kind of car for your use. And so you want to book one nearby through an online car sharing marketplace. 
For example, recently, uh, I booked a pickup truck for a few hours to pick up a desk that was extremely large, much too large for my Prius, much too heavy for my back, but I digress. Uh, but having a car, a larger car accessible nearby was critical. Of course, if you don't have that far to go and you're not carrying a desk, you could try a micro mobility option like an e-bike or a scooter. And then of course, taking your own bike or walking are always accessible, healthy options. Of course, on some trips, you may be better off taking more than one of these modalities. Now, government support plays a critical role in, in increasing use of the full range of sustainable transportation options. Of course, as an initial matter, upgrading and maintaining existing transportation infrastructure, such as roads, traffic systems, and high quality public transportation is obviously an essential part of the solution. With regard to smart mobility and how it fits in, much of smart mobility happens at the local and regional level. So municipalities with support from federal and state governments can help by establishing mobility hubs around public transportation stations and stops with dedicated spaces for car sharing, taxi and ride share pickups and e-bikes and scooters like the go hubs being piloted in Boston, as well as infrastructure throughout the city that makes it easy to walk, cycle, skateboard and ride a scooter. Public private partnerships such as mobility wallets like the transportation wallet in Portland, Oregon can be used to pay for and also incentivize use of multiple transportation options on a local or regional level. In addition, federal, state and local governments could provide incentives to share a vehicle, which studies show can take six to 10 or more cars off the road as those using that shared vehicle and other modalities no longer need to own a car themselves. The future of mobility depends on foundational technologies often referred to with the acronym CASE, which stands for Connected, Autonomous, Shared, and Electric. One striking technological advance in recent years is that vehicles are increasingly connected to the internet, and those connections will only multiply and grow faster with the increasing adoption of 5G. Connected vehicles capture data about their use and their surroundings, which can be shared with the driver, the manufacturer, and even other vehicles and devices. In addition, with appropriate security, safety, and privacy protections, governments can collect, aggregate, and act upon the data from the vehicle and from other sensors to manage traffic flows, plan public transportation routes, and allocate parking spaces for car sharing and curb spaces for pickups, drop-offs, and deliveries. Ideally, these initiatives leveraging vehicle data to improve a community's transportation system will tie into the broader effort to create smart cities, in which data from a variety of sources is used to manage and improve many aspects of community life, including, in addition to transportation, energy, utilities, education, and more. President Obama's 2015 Smart Cities Initiative was instrumental in getting many smart cities efforts off the ground. Leveraging technological advancements that have occurred since, the Biden-Harris administration is poised to help cities pilot planning strategies and support further development of smart city technologies. As more and more smart cities come online, the federal government then should work with industry and civil society to facilitate development of technology-neutral, consensus-based standards for data and technology interoperability to further innovation and drive competition in the space. Connected cars also are increasingly able then to act autonomously. They're, they're less dependent on a human driver because they can receive and process data about the vehicle and its surroundings as well and likely better than you and I. So support for the development, testing, and when appropriate deployment of autonomous vehicles can accelerate our trajectory towards safer and more efficient transportation. Now, we can go a long way to building our transportation system back better with connected, autonomous, and shared vehicles. But to achieve sustainability and reach President Biden's goal of zero net emissions by 2050, we're going to need many more electric vehicles and fast. Even though most personal cars are parked an average of over 22 hours a day, and that was pre-pandemic, it's probably more today, gasoline powers and gasoline powered, excuse me, cars and trucks alone account for roughly one fifth of the country's emissions. Electrification of vehicles and the infrastructure needed to support them needs to be a high priority, including research, development, and deployment of charging stations, as well as advanced batteries that extend the range and payload of those electric vehicles. Finally, as with all of our infrastructure, to build back better, we need to redouble our commitment to an equitable and inclusive transportation system. 
Since everyone in the community is affected by transportation, everyone needs to be invited to participate in the conversation about smart mobility and, and what it looks like in each neighborhood and for each person. While smart mobility can create a more equitable system by providing less expensive, more diverse, and more efficient mobility options than personal car ownership, we need to ensure that appropriate mobility options are accessible to everyone in the community. Now, inequity is also a hallmark of this second challenge, stagnant economic opportunity and mobility. The roots and results of the challenge are legion and complex to be sure. But today I wanna to focus on two policy areas that can help us build the economy. The first, all business formation and growth. And the second, a strong, balanced and inclusive patent system. Now, small businesses employ almost half of American employees and are unquestionably the backbone of our communities. Small businesses in turn have been acutely affected and hurt by the pandemic. According to the Census Bureau, 75% of small businesses have been negatively affected by the pandemic and over half of businesses still operating say it will take them at least six months to get back to where they were a year ago. And many businesses say they won't ever get back to where they were. So helping small businesses grow which is critical will not only help provide economic opportunity for the owners of those businesses and their employees, it will also help their communities as a whole. Accelerating small business formation and growth requires access to public and private capital, expertise and networks, both interpersonal and technological. That access is particularly hard to come by for those in underserved communities. Now, the Paycheck Protection Program, also known as PPP, has been the focus of small business aid during the pandemic. But even if PPP funds were distributed to all qualified small businesses, they can be spent to cover only certain exp expenses for a limited period of time. So while PPP is welcome assistance, to be sure, it's a Band-Aid and not enough to help our economy build back better for small businesses and their employees for the longer term. To spur business growth, job creation, and community development, we need to significantly increase funding through other programs, particularly for small businesses that create jobs in underserved areas. We also need to scale up programs focused on small technology companies, like the Economic Development Administration's Built to Scale and the National Science Foundation's Innovation Corps, as well as the core Small Business Administration's SBIR and STTR programs which funds small businesses engaged in federal research and development with the potential for commercialization. In addition to more funding for these programs, to increase the likelihood that the recipients go on to develop a sustainable business, commercialization prospects should be considered in awarding grants at the start, and those recipients should receive support to help them protect their intellectual property, or IP, and commercialize the products they develop. Because money is just not enough, although obviously helpful, because for companies to scale, they need access to expertise and networks, which can be really tough to come by for new entrepreneurs. So we need to support small business incubators and innovation hubs, which offer opportunities for experienced business leaders to provide business and technical assistance and facilitate collaboration and commerce among the cohorts of entrepreneurs that gather at these incubators and hubs. Better yet, co-locating the incubators with community colleges, historically black colleges and universities, tribal colleges and other minority serving institutions in underserved areas will open up opportunities to students and communities that wouldn't likely be available without that federal investment. Where possible, they should also include access to 3D printers and other tools that facilitate manufacturing and industrial development because that's an important part of the solution as well. And finally, hearkening back to broadband, in addition to networks of people, Virtually all small businesses need to access the network via high-speed internet to conduct business, access customers and vendors, and otherwise. Now, improving economic opportunity and mobility, as they referred to earlier, requires a strong, balanced, and inclusive patent system. Now, the patent system provides an incentive to inventors, giving them the right to exclude others from making, using, selling, or importing their invention, in exchange for making the invention public in a patent. Patents can be particularly valuable for small businesses who may lack other resources by helping carve out a spot in the market, facilitating outside investment, and providing a property right that can be licensed or sold to others. There's a reason why the sharks on the TV show Shark Tank, you've probably seen this, always ask the presenting entrepreneur whether they have a patent on their product. 
As Abraham Lincoln, the only president to have held a patent said, the patent system added the fuel of interest to the fire of genius. A strong, balanced, and inclusive patent system provides clarity of patent rights, predictability in obtaining and enforcing those rights, and engenders confidence in the system among patent holders and the society as a whole. First and foremost, a strong patent system requires an adequately resourced, technically and legally skilled and efficient US Patent and Trademark Office. In addition, patent examiners, applicants, and the public need clarity about patent subject matter eligibility, other requirements to obtain a patent, and the scope of patent rights. A strong system is also neutral to the field of technology to which the invention relates, as well as the business model of the patent applicant or patent holder. And finally, for a strong system, there also needs to be an enforcement mechanism that ensures that patent holders can enforce valid patents against infringers, including, as appropriate, receiving injunctive relief as well as damages. A balanced patent system serves not just those who file patent applications, whether solo inventors or multinational corporations, but the American public as a whole, which stands to benefit from the innovation that the patent system supports. The Patent Office must rigorously apply legal requirements and focus on quality rather than quantity. And accused infringers and other interested parties should have appropriate opportunities to dispute that patents meet those requirements. Now, I practiced patent litigation for well over a decade, when I met Professor Farley for the first time, and it's expensive and unpredictable for both the patent holder and the accused infringer. The American IP Law Association reports that even the smallest patent suits which with less than a million dollars at issue, cost each party on average hundreds of thousands of dollars to litigate. And litigation costs for larger suits can run well into the millions of dollars. And no matter how much you spend, it's difficult to predict the resolution of the complex technical issues of fact and law in patent cases. It's no wonder then that patent lawsuits almost always settle before trial. Trials connect, conducted by the PTAB, the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, trials that are often called AIA trials, are an important part of a balanced patent system. With technically trained administrative patent judges and streamlined procedures, AIA trials allow the USPTO to take a deeper look at validity than is possible during ordinary examination at a much lower cost and greater speed than typical district court litigation. Although relatively few patents are subject to AIA trials, and only a small fraction of claims in those patents are determined to be unpatentable, we need to continue to ensure the vitality of the PTAB. As Congress recognized in passing the American Vents Act about a decade ago, as a particular patent becomes more economically important, prior art may be discovered or more closely analyzed that renders the patent anticipated and obvious. It's good for our patent system to have a fair way to resolve those issues at the USPTO. Now, strength and balance in our patent system, I'm convinced of this, are not in opposition because strength feeds on balance. Balance demonstrates a commitment to getting it right to ensuring that the system is truly promoting innovation, not just at the moment of the patent grant, but every day thereafter. And this demonstrated commitment increases confidence in the system, not only by those engaged in it on a daily basis, but policymakers, judges, juries, and the population as a whole, whose confidence in turn strengthens the system. In addition to strength and balance though, the patent system must be inclusive in order to help us build back better. And this is a theme that I want to emphasize, uh, just as President Biden is, in terms of focusing on equity and inclusion. Inventors of all backgrounds participating fully in the system is critical for its sustainability and our economy broadly. The USPTO should continue to strengthen its programs for independent inventors and small businesses, including discounted filing fees, the Patent Pro Bono Program, which is uh, the PTO's chief of staff I helped expand nationally, and collaborations with other agencies. One of my favorite collaborations, which I was involved with as at the PTO, is between the Patent and Trademark Office, the Small Business Administration, and the National Science Foundation, which, at least pre-COVID, had a booth in the startup area of the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas amidst hundreds of startups, providing information about IP to those thousands of entrepreneurs and other attendees. And we need to continue focused efforts to engage and educate aspiring inventors, particularly women who receive fewer than 13% of all patents, and people of color who likewise receive a disproportionately low number of patents. Now, while our patent system protects inventions here at home, 
American businesses compete globally, and we need to work to demand respect for patent and other IP rights abroad as well. Put simply, IP infringement abroad, whether it's patent infringement, trademark counterfeiting, copyright piracy, or trade secret theft, undermine American businesses and workers. So we need to continue to vote special attention to IP practices in China, the world's second largest economy. We can't allow China to pressure American businesses to transfer their technology to Chinese businesses as a condition of government approvals and market access, or provide unfair subsidies to state-owned technology companies. We need to hold China to the commitments it has made in the TRIPS agreement, as well as last year's trade agreement, including to eliminate forced tech transfer and ensure that China doesn't sacrifice its commitment to increase IP enforcement to spur its own economic growth. We need to do this, pursue these IP concerns as part of a broader economic security and human rights strategy towards China, leveraging within the government our interagency process, as well as our international allies and partners, as well as World Trade Organization dispute settlement procedures as appropriate. Entrepreneurship, innovation, and global competitiveness through support for small business and a robust IP system are foundational for American workers, businesses, and communities to overcome our challenge of stagnant economic opportunity and mobility. Technology is not responsible for these first two challenges around infrastructure and economic opportunity. To be sure, technological developments played a role in helping create and are helping address each of them. But declining transportation has happened despite rather than because of new technologies. And Americans' economic challenges, while certainly affected by the ways in which technology has changed work and home life, are attributable to a wide range of factors. However, technology bears a larger imprint on this third challenge. Americans' connection to the nation, its institutions, and people has always depended upon confidence and trust in each other and a perception that each of us has a say and a stake. In recent decades, however, Americans have increasingly reported a loss of trust in institutions and in each other. And for many, that accompanies a decline in their feeling of control over their own lives, their sense of agency. Now, there are certainly numerous causes for this decline, but one of the most significant is a loss of control over personal data, which is collected and used in almost every aspect of life today. Technology enables companies and the governments to easily collect data, whether we input it directly and intentionally into our smartphone, whether it's captured from other actions through sensors and otherwise, or produced by an algorithm. Some of the data, like facial recognition and the minute details of every aspect of our daily lives, really couldn't be captured as readily until recently. Other data, such as that created by AI, is created anew in real time. Now, Americans are concerned about this data collection and potential loss of privacy, but are unwilling or unsure what to do about it. There was a 2019 Pew Research Center survey that showed that more than six Americans didn't think it was possible to go through daily life without having data collected uh, about them by companies or the government, and they're probably right. The vast majority of Americans believe they have little or no control over the data collected and understand little or nothing about privacy law. Now, privacy policies, which are designed to educate people about their privacy rights and obtain informed consent for data collection and use, are often ineffective. You know, for starters, most Americans, I'm sure you can relate with this, are asked to agree to a lot of different privacy policies, many of which are lengthy or impenetrable for non-lawyers and even for some of us lawyers as well. While many companies and agencies are trying hard to simplify policies or use more colloquial language, the challenge persists. The Pew survey found that almost 40% of people admitted to never reading privacy policies before agreeing to them. And only about 20 people, 20%, excuse me, of people claimed, this is what they claimed to the survey, to read them all the way through. With Americans doing more and more online, the frequency and amount of data collected and the stakes for public policy are higher than ever before. We need a privacy regime that minimizes the collection and use of sensitive sensitive personal data and provides Americans meaningful rights that give them control over the data that is collected regardless of where they live. It's also important to have reasonable ways to enforce the law when data is misused. At the same time, though, we, we don't want to impose an undue burden on companies, particularly small businesses, from using data that's properly obtained to benefit that individual and others. Given the explosion and the amount of and uses for personal data, Protecting privacy rights requires more than a robust notice and consent process, although that's obviously essential. 
we need guardrails that align data collection and use to the minimum that's reasonably necessary to achieve the legitimate purpose for which the data was collected. That includes data used for AI applications. Then once those proper guardrails are established before any data is collected, individuals need to be informed about what data is proposed to be collected, how the data will be used and shared and how it will be protected. People need to be empowered to opt in in advance to the collection of sensitive personal data with a notice and consent process that fits the context of the consent and the type of data. Now, while the main privacy policy might need to be somewhat lengthy and complex for legal completeness, at the point of consent, data collectors should aim to provide necessary information for that specific informed consent in as plain a language as possible. In addition, users should reasonably be able to access, correct, or have their data deleted. And requirements should be graduated depending on the size of the organization and the type and volume of data. Many smaller companies may not have the resource for more complex compliance regimes. Now, as many of you know, there's no comprehensive federal privacy law today. Instead, there's a patchwork of state privacy laws with my home state of California having the most restrictive. In addition to industry specific federal privacy laws like HIPAA for health information. While all these laws are motivated by a desire to give individuals more control over their data, the scope of protection and compliance requirements vary widely. So for companies that operate nationwide, complying with these divergent requirements can be onerous. Data transmission over the internet doesn't regard state lines. And so it, it doesn't make sense for an American's basic consumer privacy rights to depend on the state in which they live or happen to be at any given time. So federal law should provide a baseline of consumer privacy rights for all Americans. And then beyond that baseline, we need to balance the value of having one set of rules nationwide on the one hand, with the ability of states to provide their citizens with additional rights, particularly in areas that are ancillary to consumer privacy or rights that aren't inconsistent with the federal law. In addition, we need to keep in mind that even if there were only one uniform US privacy law, many companies have or aspire to have customers in other countries as well and will have to comply with foreign laws. Policymakers need to be aware of laws like Europe's GDPR and those in Japan, Brazil, and elsewhere and aim where possible for international harmonization and interoperability. Enforcement of any federal privacy law needs to be robust with clear and significant risks of non-compliance and potential penalties. One component should be enforcement by a regulatory agency, either one with a broader mandate like the Federal Trade Commission or a privacy specific regulator and in concert with law enforcement officials like state attorneys general. The effectiveness of such enforcement will depend on the agency's resources to maintain an expert, work, uh, maintain an expert workforce large enough for the scope of the task and the extent of available fines and injunctive relief. A more controversial approach that has garnered some support, which could be in addition to agency enforcement, is to allow a private right of action so individuals can sue companies directly. To maximize compliance while minimizing undue burden for data intensive companies from litigation though, policymakers considering this approach should evaluate whether approaches making litigation less common or less expensive, such as heightened pleading requirements, increased liability standards, or limits on damages would be appropriate. A robust privacy framework by itself won't restore trust from skepticism, but a clear federal commitment to privacy would, would go a long way to reassuring Americans that government is on their side and they're not powerless in the face of rapid technological advancement. The infrastructural decline economic distress and mistrust of institutions that make up those first three challenges, combined with long-standing biases that cause unjust action in the offline world, has created a witch's brew of social division and dysfunction. The final ingredient added to that cauldron is one born entirely of technology, social media. Social media is a place where we feel like we can have our say, where our beliefs are validated by likes, retweets, and the posts we see, and where algorithms ensure that sensationalism gets paid top dollar. And so our fourth challenge is how to overcome this vicious cycle of social injustice and division perpetuated and accelerated by misinformation and hate online. This challenge cuts to the core of whether we can solve any of these challenges, whether we can still be a functioning democracy, a functioning society if we don't address the polarization and alternate realities that social media has wrought. Fundamentally, social media and other online platforms enable efficient communication, potentially to an extremely broad audience around the world. In 1996, early in the days of the consumer internet, 
Congress passed Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which provided that online platforms aren't responsible for the user-created material on their sites, and they can't be held liable for good faith efforts to remove third-party content that's illegal or presents recognized harm. So in effect, these liability protections mean that platforms can, but don't have to, review or filter out user posts, which has enabled them to grow very quickly. Cybersecurity law expert Jess Kossoff has aptly called Section 230 the 26 words that created the internet. Now, Section 230 was enacted with the early internet in mind with a certain set of actors, actions, and potential consequences. Now, of course, the internet, along with almost every other aspect of life affected by technology, has changed dramatically since 1996. The massive impact of social media today for the offline as well as online world significantly raises the stakes of those liability protections. There's bipartisan agreement, although certainly not unanimity, that Section 230 is a problem, but profound disagreement about why and how to fix it. Many people, including President Biden, believe that platforms should be liable for hosting content that spreads misinformation, foments hate, and incites violence, such as the content that spread lies about the 2020 election and then incited the recent terrorist attack on the U.S. Capitol. Others, including many Republicans, have expressed concern that large social media platforms are censoring conservative views. Now, given the stakes, the fact that it will be hard to find consensus on exactly how to reform Section 230 is not an excuse for inaction. So how should we do it? Well, you know, the Section 230 debate has centered around well-known social media platforms that monetize user content by using algorithms to boost content to keep users glued to the site and then selling targeted advertising based on data about the user. However, there are many sites that don't monetize users' content. And those platforms, ones that don't monetize content, should retain the same liability protections that they currently have under Section 230. Platforms that do monetize content should not have liability protection unless they follow reasonable and transparent processes to moderate potentially harmful content. Platforms should specify in their terms of service content standards as well as their moderation and removal process, and then follow those, allocating the resources necessary to do the job. They need to spell out how users can flag for review content that appears to violate the standard, and they need to respond in a timely fashion. They should also specify how the poster and the objector will be notified about this and describe any appeal process. While requiring a reasonable system of moderation rather than a perfect one accounts for the fact that each platform is different and dynamic, and may have limited information on which to make the removal decision, that can't mean that platforms can evade their responsibilities. Other requirements could include public reporting of aggregate data on complaints and removal, or external oversight of policies or enforcement decisions, as we're seeing now with Facebook's Oversight Rev Board's review of its suspension of Donald Trump. And no matter the requirements, policymakers should ensure that they don't unduly burden smaller platforms or bar entry to new competitors. Some have proposed that rather than wholesale changes to Section 230, it would be more effective to remove liability protection for certain types of problematic content, such as consumer fraud, terrorist activity, or content showing child abuse. For example, in 2018, the SESTA and FOSTA bills expanded liability for platforms hosting third-party content facilitating or supporting sex trafficking. In evaluating whether to target content by subject matter, policymakers should consider whether and how platforms can easily and consistently identify that content and whether a ban risks censoring content that educates about or combats the problem. Partial removal of these liability protections will certainly incentivize platforms to comply with these requirements. But as an additional incentive, we need robust enforcement mechanisms apart from the pressure of liability in a lawsuit. Given that platforms or national federal regulators, such as the FTC, should play a critical role and be authorized to bring civil lawsuits and impose fines. In addition, to build nationwide capacity and expertise, state attorneys general could also be empowered to enforce federal law against platforms. In any case, platforms must act quickly to remove content if so ordered. Now, of course, we need to be clear eyed about the consequences and potential harm of making platforms liable for user generated content. With that liability protection over the past several decades, online platforms have allowed people to speak freely and be heard unlike any offline forum. But Section 230 wasn't carved on a stone tablet, and we can't let the status quo persist for fear we might not find the perfect solution. 
We need to maximize accountability for the dissemination of harmful speech, particularly on platforms that are monetizing lies and hate, while ensuring that the internet remains a robust marketplace of ideas. Technology and innovation, even with the most prescient policy, won't themselves overcome the four challenges I've addressed. But whether it's crumbling infrastructure, economic duress, powerless injustice, or other challenges we face, as you can see in the graph, technology plus innovation multiplied by sound public policy will get us a lot closer to being built back better. Thank you. Yay, applause. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. That was terrific. That was that was chock full. Um, so I'm glad I'm glad we've recorded it and we'll make it available. Um, that was really wonderful. Um, there, uh, I think um, the audience was was very engaged. I could just tell from the uh, questions in the chat. And um, so I've uh, I've noted some of the questions, um, trying to kind of combine some of the areas um, that people had follow up, which is really all of the areas. Um, uh, uh, terrific questions. Um, just to begin um, um, with smart mobility, um, there were a couple of um, follow-up questions um, that I thought were excellent. Um, one is, you know, um, to the extent you gave examples, they tended to be urban. Um, do you have some ideas about smart mo mobility in rural areas? Um, do you have ideas about how smart mobility policies Will transcend uh, one, ad, you know, one administration and you know, um, span multiple administrations, and um, uh, more immediate, um, you know, public transportation ridership is certainly down during the pandemic, um, and I and I, you know, I wonder what people are thinking about um, how we how we move um, after the pandemic. We're, we're all wondering what, what things will linger and what things will go away. Sure, no, I appreciate those questions. Uh, this is something I spend a lot of, of most days thinking about. So with regard to public transportation, it's obviously a tremendous concern. There's been a huge drop off in usage um, uh, and uh, you know, there's concern about what's called the, the transit death spiral, which is because there's less usage, the service becomes less good or less frequent, and then more, fewer people use it and so on and so forth. So you know, I think uh, as there's been you know, more data that uh, you know, people are, are uh, both in terms of public transportation, that few, few people are getting COVID from public transportation, and that few people get COVID from surfaces versus from airborne, um, I, I think perhaps there'll be some, you know, some you know, occur, uh, re reoccurrence of, of uh, reemergence of all the transportation use in that regard. But I think that from from a the, the value of smart mobility, and I do want to talk about about rural areas as well as other administrations. But the value of smart mobility is it gives you a lot of different options. One of which is public transportation, and I think it part of it is not just having the options, but changing mindset. I mentioned that one of the reasons why. Uh, car sharing uh, takes a, lot, a number of cars off the road is because when people start to realize, oh, I don't have to use my personal car for everything, it actually opens their minds to, oh, what is the best thing for me to use today? Maybe it is for, for me getting the truck uh, to get the uh, hernia inducing desk uh, from San Francisco or the, uh, you know, or, or a bike or scooter, for example. So I think opening that up actually helps public transportation because it puts it on the menu of many more people. Um, now, in terms of uh, from a rural perspective, uh, certainly many of the mobility initiatives have been have been focused on, on urban areas. Uh, there's been more focus in terms of uh, from a policy and funding perspective there. You know, I think rural areas are a challenge. I grew up uh, in some fairly rural areas, including in northern Minnesota, and it's just things are far away and uh, you know, at least in Minnesota in January, you don't want to <laughs> uh, bike scooters walking and riding your own bike are kind of off the table. Um, but I do think it's really important, particularly in the context of building as we build rural America back, you know, as part of a broader strategy, not specific to transportation, you know, are there transportation corridors, whereas before perhaps the public bus went in routes that may have made sense 20, 30 years ago. But now as we focus, you know, where businesses are going to be and where people are traveling, I think there's tremendous opportunity um, to leverage, 
you know, connected autonomous, uh, you know, shared and electric vehicles there. I do think as a practical matter, much of that will, will lead with urban areas, but there's no question that uh, rural areas have their own challenges and need to be uh, addressed as well. In terms of uh, transcending one administration, you know, I think although there's no aspect of, of any policy that's completely, you know, nonpartisan or not, you know, uh, imbued with, with politics, I do think that as uh, smart cities and smart mobility sort of gets proven out, I think we're pretty early in the process. Um, I think as municipalities and regions and states sort of double down on it, it will become, I think, difficult just as a practical matter for uh, a next administration to undo it. But I think I, I'm uh, a champion of it. So I do think that it will work well. And I think it will be the kind of thing where this administration does X and then the next administration, whether Democratic or Republican says, OK, X was great. Let's go to Y. Um, and I think over time that will expand the, uh, into, you know, into rural areas, exurban areas that may not be as, as tightly uh, linked to those efforts in the early days. Great, thank you. Um, let me go to the uh, latter part of your presentation because we have a number of questions about um, section 230. Sure. Um, so um, to kind of um, pull some things together, um, one question is about, you know, could you say more about what you mean by monetizing uh, content? Um, another is, um, you know, any sense of uh, how 230 came to, I mean, I think you, you um, suggested that there were some, you know, ideolo ideological differences along many of the issues that you, um, uh, touched on, but there seems to be a great political divide right now on Section 230. Um, it's become, you know, kind of a battle cry uh, on the on the far right. So, any sense as to how we got to that point? And then, um, finally, um, a question about how um, how to be fair to new entrants, uh, especially small, you know, kind of new entrants um, uh, in, in terms of platforms. Um, that wouldn't give an advantage um, in terms of the, the uh, moderation obligations that have been taken on to the very big uh, platforms that already exist. Sure, and let me say before I, I answer, I realized that I covered a lot, <laughs> a tremendous amount of ground and tried to figure out how to, there are many issues that I didn't cover at all, obviously in this space. Um, so I, I decided to do the, uh, you know, substantive buffet style. So uh, if you're not completely full, I know that uh, uh, the, the law school and, and other there are other programs that will drill down on each one of these. But mm -hmm. to answer, I'll just pick up the last question first. So on the fairness to new entrants, um, this is why I, I emphasize sort of the, the reasonable uh, and transparent moderation requirement. So that the reasonableness of it will depend on, uh, in part, on the size and 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 resources of the uh, you know of the uh, of the platform you know will you know I mean Facebook I talked about the the you know the Trump uh, you know the, the Facebook oversights oversight boards review of, of Trump's ban from Facebook uh, I certainly wouldn't ex and that's a you know it's it's a uh, you know an a list of folks in this space uh, wouldn't certainly expect small platforms to to have that certainly not at the beginning so the reasonableness I, I'm relying on that to to in fact sort of calibrate both by size, um, resources, type of content. Um, and I think the other piece that's important vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the reasonableness part is it's flexible as the internet grows and changes and as platforms grow and change. And I do think that while certainly prescient and invaluable Section 230 has been over the years, um, as I mentioned, it's not, it's not on a stone tablet. Like the, the world has changed and we shouldn't be locked in. And so I think if when we reform next, I think we do need to think of a regime that can sort of scale and flex as technology and platforms change. In terms of why is Section 230 uh, so controversial? Um, well, it's interesting in that both, uh, you know, people on quote both sides, um, you know, are unhappy with Section 230, although for different reasons. I think on the right, um, and as you can see, I, I'm not, uh, you know, I don't affiliate with that with that uh, ideological point of view. But I think on the right, there's a couple things. I mean, one of which is, it's it's a it's been I think a smart political pressure tactic, you know, which is, um, you know, I, I think platforms have been responsive, you know, for fear of of particularly when Republicans controlled, uh, you know, control most of the government, you know. 
if, if we, you know, when important people are saying things, you need to listen to them. So I think, for example, the fact that it took four years uh, or more for uh, platforms like Facebook and Twitter to ban Donald Trump, uh, despite his repeated violation or arguably repeated violations, almost on a, on, a, on a minute hourly basis of their standards, I think is part, uh, it proves some of that. So I think it's tactically a good idea. I think more broadly, um, particularly in the Trump, uh, in the era where it appeared that the Republicans, you know, ran the government, you need an enemy, you need somebody to fight against. And it turns out that, you know, social media, big social media platforms uh, sort of fit that bill. And I think, you know, the uh, they've been a, a, a great enemy for the right. I think now that there's a Democratic president and Democratic House and Senate, um, maybe there'll be more enemies that are, that are not social media platforms. But I think it's been a savvy a approach that's gotten, you know, the, the, the people that run companies uh, and other sort of the, the uh, are here have heard and also folks that support, uh, you know, that ideological view have gotten mobilized around it. And it's it's been, I think, very effective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the other, oh, I'm sorry. Did you have another? Go ahead, go ahead Andrew. Yeah, no, so uh, there was the other question about sort of monetizing content and, yes. and what that looks like. Um, so, you know, to me, there's, uh, you know, this is something that, that I think bears, obviously the devil will be in the details of, of what that looks like. What, what, what I'm trying to do is parse out. So the non-monetization of content, uh, I mean to have a site that, you know, perhaps it either, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a cost to get in the site, but there's no monetization attached specifically to that content, or in other cases, it's just a free free site and you can go in and participate. And so I think what, I, what I'm trying to do there is enable as much speech to happen as freely as possible without the burden that section, you know, a change section 230 would have for those sorts of platforms. Um, I'm thinking of monetization fairly broadly, whether it's, um, you know, directly where the content itself is, is monetizing or uh, in order to incentivize advertisers, there's a you know algorithmic configuration of the content presented in such a way that uh, you know derivatively is monetized by the platforms. Um, I think that you know because of the scope and scale of the speech, um, you know it's it intends to be sort of a um, you know an initial conversation to provide sort of a, a broader um, uh, you know a, a top line thoughts about where we can go. Um, but this is one that certainly we would uh, need to be very specific about in any reform to make sure that it was uh, aligned correctly with the, the public policy goals. Mm -hmm. Well, we only have a minute left. I, I, of course, I have follow-up questions about the the Section 101 and the PTAB, you know, especially about the unconstitution. Although I'm tempted to ask about things that you have talked about, I, I actually want to end with a question, which is why didn't you talk about this other thing? And just wondering about, you know, there have been these recent antitrust lawsuits brought against big tech companies. Um, and I don't think it fit into your four challenges, um, but. Uh, no, that's, uh, yeah. that's a good question. I mean, that is largely a product of time constraints, okay. but also, you know, the antitrust issues affect us, us I mean, large, large companies, but a small number of them in sort of the broader space. You know, I'll say um, Cam Carey, who is the, former general counsel at the Department of Commerce when I was in the administration, had a piece in The Hill yesterday that said, uh, you know, I think, you know, antitrust and Section 230 are going to take too much time, so let's start with privacy. Um, now, I say we should also tackle 230. Um, but I think for antitrust enforcement, you know, it's, it is a long and complicated process. You know, we need to define the relevant market, the antitrust in injury. So I, I definitely, that is an important topic. I didn't mean to diminish it by not including it. Um, but as you see, I sort of put put a lot into the time we had and uh, felt like that was something better left for, for another discussion. That's excellent. All right. Well, we've reached the end of the hour. Um, and I'm so grateful to you, Andrew, for putting uh, so much uh, thought uh, and, uh, um, you know, trying to cover so much. I mean, you did an excellent job of covering so much ground in such a short um, amount of time. And I want to let the audience know that we are um, recording this. Um, I, I, I got a, a note that some people were entering the room late. So we will send all registrants um, a link to the recording and we'll make that publicly available so that you can share it with other people. Um, we're delighted that you joined us today and uh, we hope that you'll come back. We have, we have a lot going on here. Um, so uh, I just want to end by saying 
Um, enormous thanks to Andrew um, for being our guest today and for enlightening us all. Thank you very much. I appreciate Second it. that. Thank you. <laughs>